Greetings and welcome back to 303 in Junior English. We now turn in our continued study of the great American poet Robert Frost to the title Out, Out. Uh, and right away, though, let's point out something interesting about this, about this title. Uh, often not noticed when you first look at it. Notice that it's Out, comma, Out. I'm with you on page 880. Page 880. Out, comma, Out, dash. Do you see it? Out, comma, out, dash. And uh, we're maybe going to have to ask a little bit about what's going on with that dash and, you know, and, and, and help us to understand what, how, this, how this poem is supposed to be read. Now, I've sometimes said to, to uh, juniors that this poem is different from almost any other poem probably that you have ever read for reasons that we'll maybe talk about after the fact, okay? So as we get into this conversation, we'll maybe ask, what makes this poem kind of uniquely significant? Finally, to read this poem, and I do, I just want to read the poem, but to read the poem, first we have to have a little bit of prior knowledge again. Some of you will know this, some of you won't, so let's just get it out of the way. The poem is set back in the backwood hills of New England, okay? Vermont has these small communities, like the communities that we're familiar with, Hyattville and the like, that are lumbering communities, lumbering. They, they cut down trees. Now, part of lumbering is they have a huge saw that spins, and you push the saw, I'm sorry, you push the wood through the saw. It is extremely dangerous work for a number of reasons. One, the saw can go, or the wood can go through the saw and then hit a knot or a bad place in the wood, and the wood will kick right back. So, for example, you, when you push it through the saw, you have to stand to the side because if that wood, if you stood like this and that goes through and you start pushing, it kicks back, it can actually go right through you. So people have died because the wood just goes right, right, pushes right through you and you die, right through your abdomen. Okay? The other problem is every bit as dangerous and that is you're pushing, you're standing correctly, but you start pushing it through the saw and the saw catches the wood and jerks it through. And, of course, the problem there is the inverse of the one we were just talking about where it kicks back. Instead, now it pulls you through. So you have to pay very close attention. But when you're working 14 hours a day at a saw, it's easy for your mind to start to wander, and then bad things can happen. Number two, you are all, I say all, most of us are familiar with the idea that on ranches, children are asked to do grown men work and women work. Okay. It's not unusual, for example, for me to teach a student who says, I was driving the truck at the age of seven when my dad and my brothers were all picking up the bales of hay on the, on the farm. And I just stood up there, I sat up there, and one of my students saying, I couldn't reach the pedal without standing in the truck, but when I stood in the truck to hit on the pedal, I couldn't see. And so they opened the door, and I looked out, and I pushed, and I just kind of drove, and then when they screamed at me, I'd hit the brake because that meant we were at the end of the field and we had to turn it around. And my dad would come turn it around, and he said, I was seven years old when I was doing this work. You know? In other words, young children doing all men's work. That's all I'm going to say about that about, uh, uh, as introductory stuff. Let's now turn to the poem itself on 880. This is one of those poems which, when I've read it, Every time I've read it in the history of my teaching this poem, I have never once ever had a student who said at level one, gee, I wonder what happens in this poem. Never. Never. To that degree, this may be the simplest, easy poem you ever read in your entire life in terms of what happens. Of course, as we've pointed out already with our study of Frost, yeah, but below the epidermis, there's always something else, right? Something else is going on. So let's take a look at it. The poem is called again, Out, Out. It begins at the bottom of 880 and then continues on to 881. The buzz saw snarled and rattled in the yard and made dust and dropped stove-length sticks of wood, sweet-scented stuff when the breeze drew across it. And from there, those that lifted eyes could count five mountain ranges, one behind the other under the sunset far into Vermont. And the saw snarled and rattled snarled and rattled as it ran light or had to bear a load 
and nothing happened. Day was all but done. Call it a day. I wish they might have said to please the boy by giving him the half hour that a boy counts so much when saved from work. His sister stood beside them in her apron to tell them, Supper! At that word, the saw, as if to prove saws knew what supper meant, leaped out at the boy's hand, or seemed to leap. He must have given the hand. However it was, neither refused the meeting, but the hand. The boy's first outcry was a rueful laugh as he swung toward them, holding up the hand, half in appeal, but half as if to keep the life from spilling. Then the boy saw all. Since he was old enough to know big boy doing a man's work, though a child at heart, he saw all spoiled. Don't let him cut my hand off, the doctor when he comes. Don't let him, sister. So, but the hand was gone already. The doctor put him in the dark of ether. He lay and puffed his lips out with his breath. And then the watcher at his pulse took fright. No one believed. They listened at his heart. Little, less, nothing. And that ended it. No more to build on there. And they, since they were not the one dead, turned to their affairs. All right, so let's pause now at level one in our annotative process. Of course, at level one, we are simply doing summary work, so we're simply going to write down what happens in this poem. As I say, this is one of those few poems that we actually get to read in our junior year, which when we're finished, nobody stands around scratching body parts going, gee, I wonder what happened in this story, you know what I mean, or in this poem, right? It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. We'll go ahead and write it down. What happens? You have basically a really simple story, don't you? It's almost like a little narrative poem, huh? Where are we? In, in the mountains of Vermont. Far, far away. Five mountains away from, you know, even civilization. We're out in the middle of nowhere. Okay. And what are we doing? Well, we're sawing wood, aren't we? And we're who? Who is, the, who is the primary character of the poem? A little boy, right? A little boy. A little boy doing man's work, we're told. His job, of course, is at the saw, and he's been doing it all day. And right at the end of the day, sister comes out, she yells, supper, and then the tragedy happens. What tragedy? Well, like I said, when you're messing with these saws, it can happen that the saw just kind of will catch the wood, and if you're not paying attention and you're holding onto the wood, it can, drag, it can pull your hand really quickly, and the hand comes off. It's very normal, and in fact, lots and lots of young children died this way on, in the logging communities uh, in, in New England and elsewhere. It's happened a lot, by the way, in the logging communities in Washington State and Oregon as well. And, the, and, and the, the, the rest of the summary is pretty simple. He dies. He dies later that, late, later that evening. The doctor um, tries to put him in, in the dark of ether to take away the pain, but then he dies. Now that is level one. That's what happens in this poem. But as we have pointed out before with the work of Frost, Frost always has something else going on. There's something more important beneath, as we said in earlier lectures, the epidermis, beneath the surface of the poem. So let's begin to pay attention to what this poem is really about. And let's point out really quickly two things at level 2A. One, the first thing we want to point out is that there's actually two poems here. You notice this? There's actually two poems here. The first poem simply tells a story. Little boy working at the wood. Sister comes out, calls for supper. Little boy has his hand cut off. Little boy dies. That's the first poem. The second poem is the last line and a half of the poem. Well, actually, the last two lines. That ended it, is the end of the first poem. And then notice the last two lines. No more to build on there. And they, comma, since they were not the one dead, comma, turned to their affairs. What? What is that about? 
Well, we're obviously going to have to ask the question as we now begin to exegete, what is really going on here? Let's go ahead now and just work through the poem quickly, and we'll be working at level 1 and 2a to try and figure out, and a little bit as well at level, at, at level 2b, as we ask what, what's actually going on in the poem. Let's work through it. First of all, let's just point out that in the title, we have out, comma, out, dash. Now that you know what happens in the poem, and now that you look at, for example, page 881, start scanning down through the lines and notice how many dashes there are. Go ahead. <clears throat> and in fact, if you want to, you can count up and be surprised at the number of dashes in this poem, which begs an obvious question. What is going on with all these dashes? And how are they being used in the poem? Of course, what does a dash do? Well, it pauses, doesn't it? It creates a, dy a dynamic pause, right? Notice the way that the poet Frost speaks about pulse. You know how when they're checking somebody if they're alive or dead, they check your pulse. If your pulse is, you know, just a little bit, notice it's little, dash, less, dash, nothing, exclamation point, dash. And that ended it. So right away in the title, we're going to be given away some kind of message here that says, this is a poem about something going out or something in there. Now, note the irony. Out, out can usually mean go away, go away. So jot down really quickly at 2A. What do you think the title means? Out, out. What is out, out? And it's a strange title, even knowing how the poem ends. What does that mean, out, out? Many have said that the best way to understand this is almost like the light goes out or the life goes out. In other words, this is a little boy who goes out. But if you look at the very last two lines, we're told something fascinating. Once the kid is dead, no more to build on there. We'll have to ask about that here in a bit. And they, since they were not the one dead, turned to their affairs. What? Who is the they? that turn to their affairs. Now, literally, at level one, what does this mean? Well, everybody was kind of huddled around the kid. The doctor is there. They check his pulse. It's a little, then it's less, then it's nothing. He's dead. Then what do all the people around the child, who are kind of hoping that the child could live, what do they do? What are we told they do? They get up, and they walk out of the room. They go to their own affairs. Quite literally, that's what they do. Now we'll have to ask at level two, what does that mean? What's that all about? And what's going on with the final two lines of this poem? Because Frost could have written the poem and ended it with, and that ended it. Period. A tragic story about a kid who gets his hand chopped off when he's working on the farm. We can, of course, very quickly work through the first part of the poem. Notice the S's, the hard sibling sounds, the buzz, saw, snarled, and rattled in the yard and made dust and dropped stove length sticks of wood, sweet scented stuff, right? When the breeze drew across it. Okay. In other words, you got these hard sounds like the sound of a saw. Anybody that's done this kind of work, you know what I'm talking about, right? That loud sound, that kind of buzz sound, we call that onomatopoeia, don't we? When the word starts to signify the sound, the buzz of the saw, right? Then we get setting under the sunset, far into Vermont. We get that sense of isolation, don't we? The middle of nowhere, we sometimes call it. We, we are familiar with this because, hello, we kind of live in the middle of nowhere, right? But we understand that concept, the middle of nowhere. Sometimes students will say, why didn't they get into a hospital? And the answer is what? Yeah, no. The doctor comes to you. You don't go to a doctor. It's too far away, right? It's too far away. Notice it tells us then that the saw ran light, had to bear a load. The irony of nothing happened. Did you see this? The irony, the last, the last line on page 880. The irony of nothing happened in line 9. Day was all but done. Notice you could take the word done and substitute it with what word? Come on, think with me. You could take the word done. Day 
was all but, you could take what word and substitute it for the word done. What's the word in the title? Uh, yeah, right? Day was almost out. Day was almost done. It's an interesting tone of voice, though, that comes with line 10. Call it a day I wish they might have said. Now, what's fascinating about call it a day is that that could be in quotation marks, as in call it a day, as in any of us that have worked in manual labor, we know what this means, right? Call it a day means we're done. But notice the pronoun I. Call it a day. I wish they might have said to please the boy by giving him the half hour that a boy counts so much when saved from work. In other words, what's the point here? Write it down at level one, what's being said. I wish they had called it a day so the boy could get at least half an hour of just being a kid, of having fun. Why? Well, because what's he do all day long? He works from sun up until sister calls supper. Of course, he's a little boy, which means he's very excited about what? When he finally doesn't have to work anymore. Notice, whoever the I is, which is the speaker of the poem, and it's an interesting question it to be, who is the speaker of this poem? Somewhat distracted, we might say, or disassociated in some ways. In other words, it's almost like an aside. Man, I wish they had called a day early, because if they had called a day early, what happened would not have happened. Of course, what does happen is next. The little boy's sister stood beside them. Notice it's not him, it's them. Everybody's there working. In her apron is an interesting little adjustment or addition. So what's this tell you about the little sister? She's in her apron, which tells you what? She's also working, isn't she? So in the same way that the little boy is working, doing his jobs, the little girl is also working, doing her jobs. And one of her jobs is, clearly, to help make supper and to go let them know it's time for supper. They quite literally are working right up to supper time. In other words, the little boy didn't get his half hour of play before supper. Notice the use of the quotation mark, supper. When you read this poem out loud, it makes sense for you to read it that way. I'll read it again. I wish they might have said to please the boy. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll start at line 10. Call it a day, I wish they might have said, to please the boy by giving him the half hour that a boy counts so much when saved from work. His sister stood beside them in her apron to tell them, supper. Of course, the next is interesting. Instead of just saying, the boy's hand slipped under the saw and cut his hand off. Any poet can say that. Instead, here you have the poet speaker who is going to almost like personify the saw. It's almost like the saw did one of these numbers when the sister called supper. The saw went one of these like this. What? It's supper. And in the process of raising its head, cut off the little boy's hand. Read it. At the word supper, the saw... And of course, hey, 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 I'm trying to teach you how to read to pay close attention. The word saw has two meanings. Saw can mean the thing that cuts your hand off. And saw can mean the past tense of see. As in, I saw my hand was cut off. Notice how the two words work rather nicely now for frost in this. I say rather nicely, but obviously it's dark, isn't it, that what happens? At the word, the saw, as if to prove saws knew what supper meant, leaped out at the boy's hand, or seemed to leap, dash. He must have given the hand, which means the little boy didn't pay close enough attention. However it was, neither refused the meeting. But the next line, but the hand, exclamation point. The boy's first outcry was a rueful laugh. If you've ever been terribly injured, you know that a lot of times if you're injured badly, one of the first things we often will do is laugh. It's a strange thing. Your body goes through immediate shock. And that, that rush of adrenaline can actually lead you to kind of laugh, especially if you've hurt yourself doing something you know you probably shouldn't have. And you kind of are like, oh, man, I just got ja I just jacked myself trying to jump my motorcycle over something or whatever. And wham! And then all of a sudden it's like first thing is to laugh. And then, of course, rueful here means, oh, no, crap. 
you know, that kind of thing. As he swung toward them, holding up the hand, half in appeal, but half as if to keep the life from spilling, what should be the word that comes after the word spilling? See, so you're starting to get it, right? The title of our poem, out. It, we're looking, let's just say it out loud, we're looking at genius. Anybody can say, hey, a kid got his hand chopped off while he was cutting wood. Anybody can say that. But Frost's project is poetically to make you look closely at this and go, oh, the life was spilling. So what's the little boy do? First thing he does after the hand, picks up the hand, swings his arm around to show, to show, show who? Right, the adults there that are there, right? Then the boy, nasty, are you reading it with me? Then the boy saw all dash. And we immediately go back to the title, out, comma, out, dash. Since he was old enough to know, comma, big boy doing a man's job, comma, though a child at heart, dash, he saw all spoiled. Of course, he's called big boy. This is hyperbole. Why is it hyperbole that he says big boy? Well, obviously, what? He's not, he's not, he's not big, is he, right? He's not big, is he, right? He's a little boy. But he, he's old enough to know what? I'm jacked. I'm jacked. Saw all spoiled. Notice that the next line is darkly ironic. Quotation. Don't let him cut my hand off. Dash, the doctor, when he comes, don't let him.